Hello. What we're going to be doing in this and all of the um, mini little videos in this series is looking at computing on encrypted data, how you do this, looking at different technologies like multi-party computation, fully homomorphic encryption. First, what we want to do is we want to set the scene, what's possible, what's not possible, and what the different relationships you need. So that's what we're going to be doing really today. The classic way of explaining what computing on encrypted data is, is the so-called millionaire's problem or the dining banker's problem. So imagine you've got four bankers here and they want to go to lunch and they're celebrating getting some big bonus. They've just been paid their bonuses for the year and they've all got a bonus of a certain number of dollars. We'll call it XI dollars, okay? And the person who's got the biggest bonus should pay. Then all they want to do is they want to work out who's got the biggest bonus without actually revealing what the bonus is and what the differences between the bonuses are. So all they learn is who's got the biggest bonus. So mathematically, what we're actually doing is computing this function here, which is the argmax function. We're computing the index of the maximum value. Okay, This is a very old problem. Um, it's called the millionaire's problem. It's introduced in the two-party case. It was introduced by Andy Yao back in the 1980s. And um, Andy won um, a Turing Award for this and other work. So it's a kind of, it's a classic computer science problem. For the solving the millionaire's problem, we can use um, a god-like figure. So if we had this trusted person, everybody could tell how much their bonus was to this trusted person. And this trusted god-like figure could tell everybody who had got the biggest bonus. Now, the, that's fine if you've got a trusted person, a godlike figure. But often in, in the real world, you don't actually have a trusted person. So what you have to do is you have to have a protocol. So what we do is we don't have a trusted person. So we replace the trusted person with a protocol. And that's what multi-party computation, fully homomorphic encryption, all the other technologies try to do is they try to replace this ability to compute on data without revealing the inputs, getting an answer, and they do this via a protocol. So how does this fit in with normal cryptography? Well, we can think of traditional cryptography, like for example, the Enigma machine, the Caesar cipher stuff you see in history books, as securing data in transport. So you secure the data as it goes from A to B. And this is done in the modern world by using TLS, SSL, IPsec, etc. The other thing you want to do with data is you want to store it. So you want to, this is what's called securing data at rest. And in the modern world, we do this by hard disk encryption, database encryption. We, make, we put stuff in a hardware security module for key storage. But data is kind of completely pointless. It's transmitting data and storing data is completely pointless because what you really want to do with data is use it. And so this new area of cryptography of computing on encrypted data secures data during computation. So the idea is that what we're trying to do with this new technology is complete this kind of triad of security properties. Now, you can kind of see this is a very new thing. Data, securing data in transport has been done you know, since Caesar's time, different algorithms. Securing data at rest is kind of a more modern thing. But securing data during computation is incredibly modern and only been available in the last 10 years and really is only really taking off now. There's loads of applications of, of computing on encrypted data that you can imagine. You can imagine this as a voting. You can imagine a vote is that you encrypt a vote and what you want to do is you want to do some computation of the vote, who's won all the elections without revealing each individual vote. You might want to do um, something to do with genomics. You might want to be able to compare two people's genomes without revealing information about the genomes bar. You might want to test whether someone's got a, a, a part of their genome corresponds to a, a predilection for cancer, but you don't actually want to reveal what that part of the genome is because it's a medical, it's a corporate secret for the medical company, or you don't want to reveal to the medical company your whole genome. This could be used in public policy to decide um, uh, interventions in the public policy arena could be used for GDPR to protect people's privacy. So there's all sorts of different ways you can use computing on encrypted data. And we'll come and touch on some of those uh, later on when we look at some use cases. So I've talked about these things before, MPC and NFHE. And we've really got to kind of understand these because they're not a magic bullet. And 
and actually when you can apply one you might not be able to apply the other so you've got to understand the situations you would want to apply these in so what is MPC multi-party computation now it's key that you have multiple parties here they engage in a protocol to compute the function securely the advantages of MPC is in comparison to FHE it's relatively fast in computation on the other hand it's very very expensive in com communication but it also currently enables a number of applications that we'll see later. FHE is very different. What happens in FHE is parties encrypt their data and they give the data, this encrypted data, to a server which computes the function in the encrypted domain. But then a designated party must get the output. Now it's very important that the designated party who gets the output is different from the person who does the computation. That's a very important property because otherwise you give, you're giving the decryption key to the output party so if the computing party's got the decryption key you can just decrypt everything so there's no security problems of fhe is that it's very very slow in computing and computation time but it's relatively cheap in communication so we have this kind of difference in the in between the the costs of fhe and mpc and we've also got this difference in fhe is that we have this distinguished party who can decrypt and it's very important the other main problem with FHE is whilst asymptotically, theoretically, it's very good, it's currently only possible for relatively simple functions. So to understand this better, it's probably best to kind of look at it from, from a systems perspective. So we want to compute something. Let's not worry about what it is at the moment. But we've got, there's a number of actors. There's the person who's got the data in the first place. We call those the input party. We're going to mark them in blue. There's the person who actually does the computing. That's the processing party. And that's who we want to keep the data secure from. We don't want the processing party to learn anything about the input party's data. And then we've got the person who gets the output. Now uh, you can imagine this is different things. You can imagine a vote, is lots of people vote. Someone tallies it up and then everybody gets the answer or something like that. Yeah, so you can imagine that these there are different situations and there's different scenarios. So a traditional, when you're computing on your desktop, you enter data into the computer, your computer does the data, and you get the answer supplied on your screen. So the top is here, picture here, is really your, you, you're working on your desktop. It's nothing new. Um, you could have many different parties entering data, um, and then this is the kind of like thing like a voting application. Everybody votes. The vote is tallied by the tallying center, and they shouldn't learn what the data was that was, uh, the, what the vote was for each individual, but you want someone else, you know, maybe the, the government or whatever, to learn the outcome of the vote. So you have this situation. You can think of cloud computing as, a, as another paradigm in this. In here, you basically, is a para cloud computing is almost like an outsourcing model, is what you have is that you enter data you send it up to the cloud, it does some processing on your behalf and returns the answer to you. Now, obviously, in normal cloud computing situations, the cloud sees all your data, so it, there's no security here. But if you wanted a secure cloud computing, you would need to have this single cloud server compute on encrypted data. Now, notice that's a single cloud server. So if you want this kind of paradigm, this is the, the this bottom paradigm here is more attuned to fully homomorphic encryption than MPC because there isn't multiple computing parties. So by definition, it's not MPC. If we have multiple computing parties, maybe for example, the guy here wants to outsource his data and he sends it to a cloud with where he splits the trust between the cloud with one being Microsoft, one being Google, and one being Amazon, and he. You know, doesn't trust all of them, but he kind of thinks that one of them is going to be okay, then he can send his data to the cloud. They can engage in an MPC protocol, which then gives the output to someone else. And that someone else could actually be the original inputting party or could actually be one of the computing parties or whatever. So there's all sorts of ways you can change this topology. But when you come and think of an application, you have to think of the application and kind of map it into this. You have to really first identify who are the input parties, who does, who's going to be doing the computation, and who's going to be get, getting the output and, and then seeing whether that actually makes sense to actually do that in the encrypted domain because it might be that your application it might leak private information but when you kind of map it into a model like this you see that actually you're always going to leak private information because your application is by definition um, something which leaks information yeah so it might be you can't secure it but first you should kind of map into this kind of di one of these kind of diagrams to see 
exactly what situation fits yours best. Fully homomorphic encryption, as I said, is kind of is very much like this: is you have multiple people can encrypt data, they send it to someone who does the encryption, the computation, and then you get an output of someone else. Now, this really is 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 a, a good model. Um, but the key point of homomorphic encryption is the green person must be different from the red person. And that is absolutely vital. And we'll see that in one of our use cases uh, later on. But this is key. You see a lot of people, they kind of come up to go, we can apply homomorphic encryption to this to secure the application. But the application is inherently insecure because the person who wants to get the output is the same person who they want to be able to do the computation. And if that's kind of inherent in your application, inherent in your use case, then it's not really going to be useful to you. So let's do a little bit of a summary. Hum fully homework encryption, the input parties encrypt their data, the computing parties perform the evaluation in the encrypted domain, and then an output party does decryption. The first scheme, it was like a holy grail since the mid-70s. The first scheme came along in 2008. In theory, you compute any function with only a very, very small overhead in cost. But in practice, the overhead has a big, big O constant in it. So that's a problem. But it's essentially very good, very fast for what, what we call low depth multiplicative circuit, uh, circuits of low multiplicative depth. So here you can think of basic descriptive statistics doing um, various forms of averages, standard deviations, histograms, and very simple machine learning algorithms. You can kind of maybe evaluate the evaluation phase relatively straightforwardly if they've got low multiplicative depth. But given that most data processing happens in the real world is actually not very advanced machine learning, it's actually very, very elementary statistics, an average, a histogram, a pie chart, if you're lucky, then this is going to be good enough for you, really. MPC is different, is that we have we could we can have a number of inputting parties, but the key point is that per people who do the computation is more than one. Okay? And we can have multiple output parties, and actually the input parties and the output parties and the computing parties could all be mixed up. But what's very important is that you have more than one person doing the computation. So the the what the key why does why is MPC more able to cope with more is because essentially the problem with FHE is we only had one computing party and that actually was a restriction. With MPC we have more than one computing party so we can in some sense compute a lot more because we know from theoretical computer science that you know like if you can do interactive protocols you can, can compute more than non-interactive protocols but the, the cost is the, the, the communication yeah so the key point is with MPC is we have more than one computing party. So that's actually very important. The downside is, is because they're communicating, they're communicating. And it's a lot of com communication because we're essentially solving the computation problem of FHE by actually moving the problem to a different domain of communication. That's a good summary of the different technologies we have. And then later on in the next episode of this kind of series, we're going to look at a bunch of use cases that at KU Leuven we've been looking at in various projects over the last five or six years. Hope you enjoyed that. Hope it's very clear, simple introduction. If you take anything away, take your use case and draw those pictures with the red, blue and green people and see what kind of model you've actually got. See you next time.